Folks, we all know that there's some crazy stuff happening out there, eh? I mean, we've got government agents coming up to us, telling us that we're all equal. They make demands upon us that we know we could never make upon them. Where's the equality? On the screen, there's a little baby. That's Elizabeth Annie Lane. She's a little baby. Came into my life uh, about four and a half years ago. Two days after the birth of Elizabeth, ministry workers came in, removed her. No investigation, no assessment. Claimed she only had one caregiver. We said, you're wrong. We're a family. We're going to meet you in court. They told us if we tried doing that, they'd see to it. She spent the first five years of her life going from foster home to foster home to foster home. Shut me up in court, cost me my baby. Folks, anyone who knows me, shutting me up even for a moment is a bit of a trick. They cost me my baby. I sat down with their act, Black's Law Dictionary on one side, Bouvier's on the other. I had an old English dictionary. I looked up every single word in there. It took me three days. Nothing but toast and tea and a couple of tokes. Took me three days and I finally saw it. Have you ever seen these laser pictures? You see nothing until you focus past it and then a 3D picture pops into your head. Have you seen those? This is exactly what I saw when I did my statute deconstruction. I looked through and it, I suddenly saw what they were doing. This is their little trick. You are not obliged to register your children. If you do, it is at that point that you're creating a legal entity or a person. You are associating this person with your offspring. You are abandoning ownership or title to that person. And the government is seizing that under the laws of maritime salvage. It becomes their chattel property. They use it as collateral to float loans or to float bonds for loans. When they come to remove a child, they're not acting on the human being at all. They're removing the legal entity you created and abandoned and they now have title to. It's like borrowing a rain jacket from your neighbor for your kid. Your neighbor comes says, I'm taking the jacket back. You let him take it with your child still in it. That's your person. That is what the government acts upon. Throughout then, since then, I've deconstructed a whole lot of acts and I've, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about your person. Next slide, please. What I found in, in, uh, in, in my research, a human being and a person are not the same thing. We've been led to believe that they are, but they're not. In Black's Law Dictionary, you'll find a definition of a person, and it says, a human being is not a person because he is a human being, but because rights and duties have been ascribed to him. Specifically, the person is that legal subject or substance of which the rights and duties are attributes. But not all human beings are persons, as was the case in Old England when there were slaves. You are not a person. You have a person. We've been, if you never know that this person exists, if the government is acting upon it and you are unaware of its existence, you're a slave to your own ignorance. Once you become aware of its existence, you can take it off at will. If that's the only thing they can act upon, you have the, the seed right there for your freedom. If you hold your jacket like this and say, go ahead and touch it, and the moment you touch it, I'm no longer associated with it, they're not going to want anything to do with that jacket. They're the ones left holding the hot potato. The purpose of, our, our, of this person, hasn't, it wasn't to deceive you. It wasn't to enslave you. It was to provide you with a very strong level of protection against government tyranny. If they never act against you as a human being and they're only acting against your person, you always have the option to reject their governance and therefore escape tyranny totally and absolutely peacefully. The person, the purpose of the person, it is for your benefit. You, as a human being, do not exist for the benefit of your, your legal fiction. Your legal fiction is there for you. Just like a rain jacket is there for you. And it, it, if you're in the rain, it's a good thing. If, however, it's a sunny day or you're in a lake, water up to your neck, it's something you want to remove lest it's going to harm or hamper you. The same is true with your persons. They kind of, they kind of, I think they kind of hoodwinked us. They created a situation when they got rid of slaves. They said, okay, everyone can be persons. If you do have slaves, then yes, it's beneficial to be a person. If, however, there's no more slaves, becoming a person is kind of saying, yeah, I'll take that lowest totem pole. In the deconstruction of the acts, what I found, what I'll tell you about in the next little 30 minutes or so, we're going to go through the six fundamental tricks that I've, uh, that I've noticed in deconstructing their acts. When you sit down and you look at their body of words and you start deconstructing it, trying to figure out what the truth is, these three, they always use them together. Smoke. The purpose of smoke from a tactical perspective as an ex-military uh, uh, soldier 
The purpose of smoke is it, it's an irritant, it's an obscurant, it will hide movement, it will irritate your eyes, and it usually precedes an attack. You can find smoke in their words by looking for excess words that make no sense, that really aren't necessary. If they start defining words that you know the definition of already, like look in the Children and Family Service Act, they identify, they define the word child. Why would they do that? The people using the act, they all have university educations. The reason they're putting this excess, excessiveness in there is because they are creating movement, they're changing the definition just slightly, and they need to do that for, in order for this smoke to work. The next one is the mirrors. Let's suppose for a moment that this right here, this, this piece, next seminar we've got to get a mirror, guys. Let's suppose this is a mirror and I'm standing right here. You would see me and you would see my reflection and you would have no, there would be no confusion. You would know which is which. You would know which is which because you would see me and you would see the edges of the mirror. If, however, we use smoke and we hide the edges of this mirror and all you see is me and this reflection and you never really know which one is the mirror, you're going to have a little bit of confusion. If they incorporate the next one, next slide please, if they incorporate the camouflage and they use camouflage to hide me, my physical body, so all you see is the reflection and you do not see because of the smoke the edges of the mirror, from your perspective, this reflection will appear to be a real thing. And if you never investigate, if you never step up and touch it and go, hey, look at this, it's just glass, you will always be deceived into thinking that this reflection is a reality, it's not a reality. The next ones they use, switching of the bait and the slider. If people here have gone out, I'm sure, buying a car, you buy any product, they offer you one and then they slip you another one. That right there is switching the bait. From a distance, it will appear that you have an obligation. You'll go, oh, okay, I got an obligation. I'm going to meet my obligation. You'll pick up your obligation. You won't even look at it because you're sure that it's an obligation. Closer examination will reveal that it's not an obligation at all. It's a choice, a voluntary choice. They've switched it on you. They will get you to believe you have an obligation when you do not. They use the next one a lot. With sliders, any time they are giving you a document and they put it on a counter and it makes a little sliding sound, and they want you to pick that document up, that's a slider. They are giving you an opportunity. It's a voluntary action. No one is taking this document and enforcing it on you. You are acting voluntarily to pick that up, and that's why they slide it like that. You go ahead and touch it if you want. You have the right to pick this up and look at it and flip it over. Say, no, I don't want this. Put it back down. Slide it right back to them. Examine what it is they're sliding to you because every time they're sliding you something, you've played hearts where you want to get rid of the queen of spades. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get you with the queen of spades. Flip it over, look at it, say, no, I don't want it. Slide it right back to them. There's nothing they can do. Anytime they're using a slider, they are doing something which is going to cause you to give them authority over you. The next one that they've got is hiding the monkey. That's my, that's my monkey. <laughs> Let's suppose for a moment I walk into a party, I got a monkey with a bell on its tail. My monkey is on a leash and he starts chucking dumplings at you. And you say, dude, stop that, your monkey from chucking dumplings at me. And I say, monkey, that ain't no monkey. See the bell? See how it's attached to a furry prehensile bell holder? Monkeys have tails, not furry prehensile bell holders. Therefore, that's not a monkey. And you say, oh, well, where are them dumplings coming from? They use, they will trick you into giving up your highest status because the moment you hear that little bell on the monkey, you're looking the other way automatically. And you've got no complaints. If you ever end up in court and you try saying, Your Honor, I just didn't see the monkey. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to say, Listen, Your Honor, it was on a leash. It was chucking dumplings and I put a bell on its tail. How could you not see the monkey? And you'll have no excuse. You'll have no excuse because they have trained you like a Pavlovian dog. The moment you hear that little bell on its tail, boom, you're looking away. I'll show you what that little monkey is later. Any questions so far?
basic things that they, they don't really want you to know. 13 fundamental things that if you remember what they are, you are going to have all the power in the world over them. I'm going to teach you they're obvious and the reason they have the power is because no one there can dispute it no one not one person who is your go going to try to be your opponent or your adversary is going to be able to dispute them because they will accept it fully and completely that's where the power lies you are dealing with a human being they are just human beings they'll tell you I'm an agent for the government I'm a peace officer I'm this I'm that no you are a human being in a common law jurisdiction and that's all there is to it that's first and foremost and I'm not forgetting that if you remember that they have to remember that the key thing about remembering this is you can remember a couple of things yes you can affect them you can use they will respond to emotion they will respond to threats they'll respond to a, a baseball bat in the bottom of their knee they will respond they will also respond to love compassion and truth they are human beings and if you treat them with the dignity that all human beings are worthy of they will respond as a human being as well don't look at them as anything more than simply a human being using a tool and the tool that they are using is words all they are are words the government is just composed of human beings using words take away the human beings you don't have a government take away the words you don't have a government you need those two things in order for anyone to come up to you and claim any level of authority over you. The good thing about these words is that if they start losing some of them, they lose all their authority. If someone comes up to you and points to a body of words and says, this body of words gives me authority over you, and you say, really? What does that word right there mean? And they say, uh, <laughs> I don't know. What just happened to their authority? Gone! They have to know what the words in their own mandates mean. And this is where we have what their tool that they use against us, now we're going to use it against them because some of these words are very deceptive. They're ambiguous at least. These deceptive words, words that have ambiguous meanings that open up and allow for a, a change in the, or a shift in the power structure, these words are deceptive, they're ambiguous, you can ask questions. You can bring these human beings who are using words to claim authority, ask them questions concerning the deceptive words, and if they don't know the answer, their authority is gone. You don't need any anger, you don't need any hatred, you don't need any violence whatsoever, just a mind and uh, ask some questions. The next three things they use. This is probably one of their, their biggest tricks here. They get us all thinking, you, you read in the paper a new, a new law has been passed. They get you thinking that these statutes are laws. Statutes are not laws. If you look it up, you'll find that the definition of a statute is a legislated rule of society given the force of law. It's a law, it's a rule that has the force of law within a structured society because somebody gave it that force. Remember, we're all equal here. Who can give those words the force of law? Only you you have decided to give those statutes the force of law within your societal structure. A society, if you look at the definition of that, it's a number of people joined by mutual consent to deliberate, determine, and act for a common goal. Your consent is required for any statute to have the force of law, and you can spot these, they'll have the word act right in the title. Point out the word act to any government agent asking or claiming authority over you, say what exactly does that word right there mean? and you will be two steps away from consent. Consent is not assent. You don't have to make a positive affirmation in order for them to achieve consent. Your silence and inaction will raise the appearance of consent. Every time there is an election, within 30 days, your MLA, your MP, will send out to every address, every residential address, Hi, your new representative. 
if you don't call her back within 30 days and say, uh, no, you're not, sorry, you're fired, she has achieved the consent she needs or he needs to act as your representative. Consent can be achieved when you do nothing. My first book was called Registration, Application, Submission means drop them, bend over, and don't expect lube, how the government really gains power. I was angry at the time and big on long titles. <laughs> These three words is how the government has been getting authority over us. Registration, application, submission. All of the power they have over you is because you have put your signature on a document with one or two or three of these words. The word registration. What does it mean? I thought, it, oh, I just put my name down. Nuh-uh. Historically, it goes back hundreds and hundreds of years to an act of a ship's captain signing over his ship and all chattel contents to the harbor master for safekeeping. Chattel contents included the slaves, the condemned, those in debt, anything that could be party to a contract essentially was considered chattel property. Application, oh, and I found this one out, I was like, oh my goodness, son, I'm telling. Application. <laughs> application means to beg. To beg, plead, petition, implore, entreat, or request. I was like, beg? I started looking at the assumptions. If you want to look at a word and figure out what this word, what effect this word is going to have on your life, you need more than just the definitions. You need to look at the assumptions that this definition rests upon, and then you need to look at the implications created. The assumptions created by begging. He who begs knows exactly what they're begging for. Well, mind you, in one time in Toronto, I had a woman ask me, can I have anything? But for the most part, someone's begging, they know exactly what they're begging for. They know exactly what they are willing to give up for it. They are acknowledging the authority to grant, or if it doesn't exist, they're willing to create it through transference. If I ask, if you beg me to take your shoe off and scratch your toe for you, maybe then I would have the authority to do that. Prior to me, prior to you begging me to take your shoe off, I try touching your property, you can kick me in the teeth. We transfer authority if that authority doesn't already exist when we apply. And finally, because you are a human being and no one's ever obliged to beg, it's an entirely voluntary action. You can never claim, oh, they made me apply. No one has ever, ever made you apply for anything. Submission. Submission is their other tricky little definition. It means to agree to bend to another's will or to leave to another's discretion. If you are agreeing to bend to someone's will, you are in contract with them. And again, in order for it to be voluntary or lawful, it has to be voluntary. If you are agreeing to leave something to someone's discretion in order for you to legally leave something, you must have possession and ownership of it. And again, you're abandoning it and that's an entirely voluntary action. They get all their power when you put your signature, which is evidence of an oath, on a document with the words registration, application, submission. They do it with everything. You want to register your kids? What are you going to do? You're submitting an application for registration. You want to register your vehicle with the motor vehicle branch? You're submitting application for registration. You want to register your real property? Submitting application for registration every time. And that's why the lawyers got it. They're, they're in all the power. You came to them and begged. Next one, please. A lot of people here are familiar with the natural person concept, and people have been using it. I'm here to tell you I don't think you should use the word natural person at all. If you look at the definition of natural person, it tells you a natural person is a human being who has the capacity for rights and duties. If you tell me that you have the capacity for rights and duties and I'm a government agent, you label yourself as a natural person, a human being with the capacity for rights and duties, who am I to deny you your rights and duties? In Canada, the moment you define yourself as a natural person, they have an obligation to give you your rights and duties. Imagine you're going up to a bar, you got a, uh, say, a pint glass. You go up and you say, hi, uh, boom, you're presenting your beer. They then top it up because you've got a right to present it. Once you do that, they have a duty to top it. 
When you call yourself a natural person, you're presenting your empty beer, you're telling them top it up. There's a very big difference between being a human being who has the capacity for rights and duties and a human being who has the ability to choose to have the capacity for rights and duties. We want to be the ones who choose. It's the difference between walking up to the bar with your pint glass upside down and they can't pour anything in it. And they say, turn your glass over. No, I don't want your stinky beer. Next one. Common law right to travel. A lot of the things that they get us with, we, we, they've got us believing that in order for us to exercise some of our more, most fundamental human rights, we have to engage in contract with them. We want a license. We have to go submit an application for a license. What's going on? Fact is, you have the common law right to travel. You can get out on that highway in a privately owned automobile, travel from point A to point B. As long as you're not engaging in commerce on the highway, there is not one thing unlawful about it. I have audio tape somewhere I got to find of a head lawyer in ICBC. I asked him flat out. I said, is there anyone in your organization with, uh, with a bar card who's willing to swear under oath and on their full commercial liability that the common law right to travel no longer exists in British Columbia? His response was, <laughs> no, it's there. And you give it up every time you go and you register your motor vehicle. You are not obliged to register your motor vehicle. If you do, you're signing over partial ownership of it to the state. They use a lot of trickiness with it. If you look at the Motor Vehicle Act, they define a motor vehicle. They'll say motor vehicle, in brackets, means a vehicle not run on rails, designed to be self-propelled, yada, yada, yada. The, the brackets, what I found out, when it's in quotation marks, that means these words, these printed words. Anytime you see these printed words in this act, you know it is referring to something that has these attributes. Where does it say all things with those attributes are being referred to? It doesn't. If I define an apple as a round red fruit, does that mean all round red fruits are apples? No, you got cherries, pomegranates, certain varieties of the more exotic Asian pears. All of these are red round and fruits and they're not apples. When they define a motor vehicle, they don't give you the full and complete definition. There are other attributes they've left out. And you will find those attributes further in the act if you get to section 3.1 of the Motor Vehicle Act. It says the owner of the motor vehicle must apply for and receive registration and insurance in the form required by ICBC. That's the missing attribute. The moment you do that, yes, now your property is a motor vehicle. And there's no one in ICBC going to claim that you have an obligation to register your personal property. No one. This is one of the most fundamental things we have to remember, folks. Equality before the law is paramount. Everything else is gravy. No matter who you're dealing with, government agents, police officers, judges, we're all human beings in a common law jurisdiction. We are all equal. Every time you write to them, you'll notice a bunch of my letters. I put that right up at the top. That's where we're starting at. Everything else doesn't matter. And if they don't want to accept that concept, that them, then they and I are equal, I don't want anything to do with them. They're crazy. They're, they're, they're crazy in the head. I don't want to play with them. And then finally, the big monkey. Who here has ever read their Bill of Rights? Who here remembers the very first sentence? Oh, it's key. It's the big monkey they're hiding. It says, and you'll find it uh, ex or expressed in the Constitution as well, they say that Canada is a nation founded upon the principles and the belief in the no belief in the principles of the supremacy of God and the rule of law. The supremacy of God and the rule of law. I went to my MP's office and I asked him. I said, "Yeah, I'd like a bill of I'd like a the Bill of Rights. I grab this. They'll give you one. It's really nice. You can frame it, eh?" I said, "Wow! It says here Canada is a nation founded upon the the principles or the belief in the principles of the supremacy of God. Is that true?" She said, sure is. I said, that's cool. <laughs> I said, this tells me there's a hierarchy in God's right up at the very top. Is that true too? She said, I sure hope so. I said, me too. Who's number two? She's like, uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe you should see a lawyer. I was like, why should I see a lawyer when you're the one saying, I don't know. I'm pretty sure this is an offer. Where do I accept it? 
The fact is, they've laid out a, a thing for you. Have you ever played Snakes and Ladders? Imagine Snakes and Ladders where the only way to win this game is to never even pick up the dice. At, right at the start, there's one ladder leading right to the win, and that's the only way to get there. Your Bill of Rights, the very first section, if you look at that as an offer and you accept it, you put yourself legally in a position where in this hierarchy they have designed you are number two to God. If they want any power over you, they've got to do one of four things. They've got to claim and then prove that they exist above God. They've got to claim and then prove they are God. They've got to claim and then prove that somehow they exist between you and God. Or they can produce a document upon the face of which can be found the verifiable signature of one deity commonly known as God. And if they can't do that, they have no claim to power. They have nothing. And here's the beautiful thing. They don't even bother defining God. How can they? God isn't defined. God can be a five-week-old tuna sandwich in the back of your fridge. You decided to personify and deify by calling God, God, my godly tuna sandwich. And if you're happy being number two to a tuna sandwich, you can do that. I want to be number two to the creator of the universe. But if you want to be number two to the tuna sandwich, you can go ahead. You have every right in the world to stand right up and claim the status of a child of God. But the moment you do that, you do accept a lot of responsibility because then you have to look at everyone else with the same eyes. You guys having fun yet? I'll tell you a little story. Who here doesn't like dealing with income tax people? I went down there to income tax. I was looking for my, my GST rebate check. I went in there, very true story. I said, yeah, I'm here for my GST rebate. She said, oh, well, what's your social insurance number? I gave it. She punches it in. I'm sitting right here. She's like this. She looks. You haven't filed your taxes for five years. I said, really? I thought it was more like seven. <laughs> she didn't like that. She went off. She said, what kind of person do you think you are? You want all the benefits. You want your road. You want your health care. You're the first to complain if you don't get your welfare. But when it comes time for you to file your taxes, you don't want it. Nah, nah, nah. And I got to the point where I'm like. <laughs> so she stopped. She said, okay, well, uh, I'm going to put in the computer that you've been informed of your obligation to file. I said, nothing would make me happier. She went, huh? I said, yeah, you go ahead and you put that information in that computer. When you're done, I want you to put in that computer that I'm questioning the very validity of the Income Tax Act because I can't find the preamble anywhere. Put in that I'm directing you to read that preamble to me within seven days and that if you don't do that, that's gross negligence equaling fraud. When you're done doing that, I want to see the section of the act empowering you to belittle, berate, harangue, and harass me for four and a half minutes like you just did. And if you can't show me that, I want to see your supervisor with a complaint form in their hands. She looked at me, she started fish facing. She's <laughs> I waved my hand, I said, go ahead, put it in there. She said, oh, I'll go get my supervisor. <laughs> she goes, gets her supervisor. I mean, no, no judgmental here, but I thought it was a Coke machine and a gray flannel dress. <laughs> she comes out, she goes, is there a problem here? I looked at her empty hands, I said, actually, now there's two. <laughs> I said, I directed that girl to come back to, to tell you to come to me with a complaint form in your hands, and I don't see one. So either you're going to go get a complaint form and come back to me, or you're going to go get your supervisor and tell them to come back to me with two complaint forms. <laughs> she turns as gray as her dress. She leaves, comes back. No complaint form, a eh? quality assurance feedback report or something like this. <laughs> so I, I start filling it out. I'm like, oh, what's that girl's name? Oh, Mary Sinclair. Mary Sinclair, she's behind the divider like this. <laughs> I said, what's the date today? The girl tells me, she goes, December 13th. I said, I know that. What year is it? <laughs> 2003. Okie doke. Hey, maybe we can settle this without a complaint form. Mary over there, she told me that I had some sort of obligation to file or something like that. She said, you do. I said, says who? She said, it's the law. I said, what law? She said, the, the uh, Income Tax Act. I had gone to their librarian, sweet talked that librarian moments before, got a brand new 2004 copy of the Income Tax Act. Put that down, said, is that what you're talking about? She looked at it, looked at the date, went... <laughs> 
where did you get that? I said, oh, I have my sources. Is that what you're talking about? And she went, well, what does that word right there mean? Pointing out the word act. She looks at us, she went, I don't have to answer any of your questions. <laughs> I reached into my little briefcase. I grabbed one of their pamphlets. Right on page six, it says, your right to clear, complete, and accurate information. I said, look at that. It tells me I have a right to clear, complete, and accurate information. <laughs> wow, that tells me I have a right to ask questions, and you have a duty to answer them. There's 2,566 pages in this Income Tax Act. I'm pretty sure I can come up with 10 questions per page. When do we start? <laughs> she looked at me like, why are you doing this? I'm like, because the government stole my baby. She said, well, that's not us. I said it was people just like you. I mean, and where do you think they get their money from? So let's start. When I got some questions. She's like, but, but. She started to get upset. I said, listen, you don't have time for this. I'll call you back in a week. You read the preamble of that act to me, and I'll accept that I have an obligation. If you can't read that to me, we are going to start asking some questions, and you're going to answer all of them. I call her back a week later. The poor girl is in tears. She's crying. She's, I'm getting in trouble for asking about the preamble. They're telling, I just want to help people get as much back from their taxes as possible. And I don't even know where to ask anymore. <laughs> I felt pretty bad for the poor woman, eh? I said, look, here, you got my file open there. She opens it up. Yeah, it's right here. I said, did Mary Sinclair put in there that uh, she informed me of an obligation? No, there's nothing here. Okay, here. You put in my file that I agree never to seek information from you, and you agree never to seek information from me, and we're done. Okay, I'll put that in your file. <laughs> Haven't tried talking to me since. Did you get your job? No. No, I had to give up my 20, my 2,500 bucks, but I figure that's, that's better. I'd rather have, you know, let them keep their money. I don't want it for the most part. And it, it's all about when you start, once you start thinking free in order to become free, you start not having the answers, but having the questions. It's all about having the proper question. A couple summers ago, I was doing stand-up comedy. I wanted to find a place where I could do some. There was a place called Here on Earth. It was an after-hours club. They were selling beer. They let people smoke pot. The government didn't like that too much, eh? No license or anything. I call them up. They said, well, we're, we're shutting down. We're sitting here contemplating shutting down. Liquor Control Board shut us down last four weekends running. We're running out of money. I'm like, I'll be right down there. <laughs> I got down there, looked through the income, looked through their Liquor Control Act, wrote a letter, sent it off, said open up next weekend. We opened up next weekend, liquor control inspectors out in the alley. They have no power over unlicensed establishments, none whatsoever. I pointed that out to them. So they came with the property use. They put a notice right on the door. Notice this. I ripped it right down, wrote on the back, notice this. <laughs> Gave it back to them. They came back next with a, first it was property use, then business bylaw. Where's your business license? You have no notice. Here, now I do. Notice this. Then they came back with the fire department. Fire department, we love you. You're going to keep us safe. Come on. Hey, how much is this going to cost us? They're like, oh, no, they're paying for it. Okay, just we don't want any, any contract with you, or we'll pay for it, but don't go hooping us. The marshal, he came in, replaced that one exit light. He ends up, he's in the alley, and he's telling the guy, I'm not getting involved in your politics. It's safe, and that's it. He walks off. <laughs> Took me four weeks. I got the police officers to a point where they would come to the door, knock on the door, identify themselves as peace officers. We would invite them in merely to keep the peace. They would do a little walk around, then they leave. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, officers. Have a great day. People thought I was paying off the cops. <laughs> All I was doing was educating them, asking them the right questions. And at one point, while I'm in this, this process, a, a squad car comes up. I'm in the alley. I'm having a smoke. And squad car comes up, says, what's happening in there? I said, oh, it's a celebration of life. And they said, well, do you have a permit for that? I said, we need a permit to celebrate life? <laughs> the guy, it was a girl driving and then a guy in the other thing, and she says, well, people are, are breaking the law in there. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, they're smoking pot. We have, we have rec reports that they're smoking pot in there. I said, so? I said, that's against the law. What law? The Controlled Drugs and Substance Act. I'm like, 
The Controlled Drugs and Substance Act is a statute. You're failing to distinguish between statute and law. That's gross negligence. It's equaling to fraud. When your actions interfere with my, my rights or my comfort, you're being a nuisance, and that's an offense under Section 1. Okay, see ya. <laughs> Come back later. You start pointing out the things, as long as you're treating them with a certain amount of dignity because you are recognizing them as human beings, they don't care. They've got better things to do than to try to be your master and to get you into the position of slave. Do we have a little film? mention that uh, it seems like it's very difficult to understand these concepts. There's only a few key ones. They're quite simple, and once you start understanding those, you're not going to have to worry about everything else. Imagine for a moment you have a map. You want to go from point A to point B. You only have to worry about what's between point A and point B. You don't have to worry about everything else. We're going to try to keep it very, very simple, and the one thing, remember, Canada, it's a nation founded upon the rule of law. The rule of law, folks, is what this entire game is all about. It applies to everyone equally. I don't care if you're king or pauper, merchant or, or creditor or debtor. The rule of law applies to everyone. It's a beautiful thing. When you start understanding it and using it against the government agents, they're going to be hooked. The rule of law is very simple. It says conflict is avoidable. It's unnecessary. It's undesirable. When it raises its head, we are going to deal with it, and we're going to use discussion, negotiation, and then, if necessary, adjudication in a court of competent jurisdiction. You have the power to offer discussion. If they come to you and they want to get you into court, they'll try to get you into the adjudication. They want you to slide right past the discussion and negotiation phase, because in court, the judge can assume and operate on the assumption that you have tried to discuss, you have tried to negotiate, and it failed. That's where his power comes from. We have brought courts down, wind goes right out of their sails. If you point out, Your Honor, there has been no discussion in this matter, and I can't consent to adjudication, they lose all their power. If you do do this, one thing we did mess up with, you should have all the charges removed right then. They aren't discussing in good faith if you're discussing under charges hanging over your head. They are not set up to engage in discussion. The lawyers don't want to discuss it. They want to fight. They make all their money in adjudication. You can take all their fight away from them just by saying, look, I just want to talk. Just got some questions. I just want to talk. Give them notice of that. They have no power. The court's competency of jurisdiction is a result of, of or the attempt of discussion and the failure of it. They have no jurisdiction without that. In, in this little game that they've got us playing, there is a hierarchy to law. If you look on the right-hand side, natural law is the epitome. That's the top. Natural law is essentially your rights and duties to those whom you love. Imagine for a moment you're in a forest. You live there with your family, no one else is anywhere around. Your rights and duties to your family essentially boils down to the natural law. It's all about love. The natural law, the up, up, what law is all about, it's all about fundamentally love. Below that you will have commercial law. Let's suppose in this forest, there's now not just you with your family, there's another family, they, you live a hundred miles away. Once a month, you want to trade some of your berries for his fish. The commercial law now will deal with your transactions. And these commercial law has to do with trust. You need to be able to trust the people you're engaging in commercial actions with. Below that, you have a common law. The common law... Imagine for a moment in this forest where before you only had two people, now you've got hundreds and thousands of families living here. You need a, cer certain, uh, a certain system, a certain structure that's going to allow all of these people the protection that commercial law will afford them. It boils down to compassion and it boils down to the, um, the Magna Carta, which essentially said that the government within this structure are bound by their own rules. That's essentially what the common law is about. 
all of this, this side of the hierarchy of law, this all deals with your body as a human being. It has to do with your rights and your responsibilities and your duties as a human being in a common law jurisdiction. The other side of that is equity. This is all about law and truth. This side is all about equity and fiction. That line in the center represents the mirror I showed you over here. On the other side, you have statutes, you have regulations, bylaws, and orders. They don't act on your body at all. They only act upon your person. They only act in equity. And here's the thing. People who exist in equity and act in equity cannot exit equity. Grab something that's existing only in law, drag it into it, and then try affecting it. Equity is a bitch, as they say, and you can only enter into it voluntarily. No one can ever force you. That's why they're using applications, registrations, and submissions in your signature. You voluntarily stepped into the equity game. A lot of what they're doing, let's bear in mind, we are all equal. If we are all equal, who has the right to make any demands upon you? Who has the right to do anything to command you, demand you, put orders on you? Who has the power? No one. The thing is, they never do that. Everything they do is an offer. Everything. It might appear to be a demand. They might label it an order, but then it's an offer for you to accept that their offer is an order. If we are all equal, the only tool they can possibly have is an offer. They get you to break the law because of how you deal with their offers. And it's all about dishonor. Let's suppose for a moment, you're at home, you're watching TV, your sweetie's in the kitchen. He, she asks you, honey, would you please take the garbage out? And you just ignore them. They ask you 20 times, you just keep ignoring them. Are you going to get any sweet, sweet lovin's that night? No, you dishonored your lover, you're not getting any. Now let's suppose they ask you again, would you take the garbage out? And you just say, no, and you flat out reject. Are they going to be happy with that? Are they going to express their love and respect for you? No. You've dishonored them. Your third option, they ask you to take the garbage out. Yes, honey, I'm right there and I'll do it right now. But then you might miss the big game on TV. You have a fourth option the government doesn't want you to know about. They're perfectly happy when they send you a notice and you ignore it. You're stepping into dishonor. They'll get you for it. They love it when you, dis when you dispute it and you say no and you reject. You're in dishonor. They'll love you for it. They love you even more when you just bend over and do what they want you to do. Just get up and go do what they're telling you to do. You don't have to. You've got a fourth option. It's called the conditional acceptance. Remember, we're all equal. Honey, will you take the garbage out? Yeah, I'll take the garbage out. No problem doing that. And if you can prove to me that it can't wait for a commercial, I'll do it right now. But I want some lovin's too. <laughs> you can apply your conditions to it. You can, you can deal with them. Don't think they're making orders. Don't think it's a command or a demand. All it is is an offer. And if it seems like more than an offer, the fundamental, the foundation of their offer is for you to accept their offer to agree that they have the power to order you. Questions? I see you thinking. This entire game that you are playing with them is about conflict. Can I get you in conflict? If I can get you in conflict with your fellow man, one of you are in dishonor. If, imagine uh, some people here are parents, I'm sure you've got a couple of kids, they're playing out in the yard. You hear a big brouhaha, you run out to investigate, you find one kid's got mud all down his back. The other kid's got mud all over his hands. Who started the fight? It's pretty simple and easy to see the guy with the dirty hands. What they will get you to do is to deal with things that create conflict, and once you're in that conflict, you're going to be in conflict in dishonor. Let's say so you get a parking ticket or you get a violation <coughs> ticket. You end up going to court for it. They are not concerned so much with what you did at that point that is getting you into court. 
They're more concerned with what did you do in that 30-day period. There's a very good reason they don't charge you and bring you to court two days later. You've got 30 days grace. You've got 30 days to offer amends. 30 days to apologize, find peace with your fellow man. If you do that, the court has nothing to say. And if you don't do that, because those 30 days went by and you made no offers, guess who's in dishonor? And then it doesn't matter what it's all about. All the judge has to look at is who is in dishonor. In order to avoid conflict, what we are going to do, we accept everything. Everything they want to give you, I accept that and I love you for it. Thank you very much. But with my conditions attached to it. If you accept every offer they make, how can they take you to court? They can't. They can't. If you're accepting everything they offer, they have no reason to claim conflict. A lot of times what you're going to be dealing with are parking tickets, things like this. You'll get notices on your door, you'll get stop work notices. They'll hit you with a notice. A notice is, in effect, an offer which you can't refuse. If you do, you'll go into dishonor. But here's a funny thing about a notice. A notice has to be understandable. It has to be clear, concise, and, under, uh, yeah, clear, concise, and understandable, and unequivocal. That's it. If they hit you with a notice, like when I was working with here on earth, they hit us with a notice, I took this down, and you can discharge a notice by seeking clarification. Yeah, I got your notice, but I see this word, and I don't know what you mean by that word, so please answer this. What does this word mean? What does this word mean? What does this word mean? Thank you. I'm happy to talk with you. You discharge their notice, and what they want you to do is ignore it and go into dishonor. We went in there, we followed the process, got a letter back. We're withdrawing this. This is their trick. You get a little parking ticket. They are notices. This is not a bill. You can't take this and pay. This is just a notice giving you information, telling you there's something you should pay attention to. So what do we do? We're going to accept it. We write a little letter. We say, look, I noticed your notice, and here's my notice noticing your notice, and I hope you notice my notice noticing your notice. Because now we're in discussion. I accept your notice. I accept that there's something there. Now, what would a bank do? A bank isn't going to go waste their time fighting in court for 40 bucks. No. What do you do? You accept it. And then you become the administrator. And you tell them, look, I'm more than happy to pay you. You're apparently claiming I owe you money. I'm the administrator here, and I will settle this account as administrator. But first... I have to do a little verification, eh? I mean, you don't want me paying off a bill without actually seeing the bill. I have to verify this debt, so please send me a bill. Please send me a bill that's going to have a signature on it. When you're done sending me that, I want to see the contract, the lawful two-party contract supporting that bill. If you can't show me that, stop asking me for money. You, if Once you do that, you get it to a point, what you will end up getting... They call a remittance, the final notice, your final notice, you must pay this. If you look on that envelope when you open it up in the lower corner, they call it a remittance. They want you to take this remittance and send it in with the check, see, for $40. Here's the thing, if this was a bill, why do they want it back? When's the last time you ever paid a bill and then had the person who presented you with the bill demand that bill back? You pay the bill so you can keep it and say, I don't owe you anything anymore but they want it back. What's a remittance? I looked it up. A form of money. It's money it's sent by one merchant to another, either in bill of exchange, uh, check, specie, or otherwise. They have sent you a piece of paper worth $40, but they messed up because the word that they put on it is amount, not value. What you are going to do is you are going to take that little remittance. Imagine for a moment, this is what they're doing, I think. Imagine you want someone to come over and cut your grass. So you hire a company to come cut your grass, and then he's halfway through cutting your grass. You realize you're a stockholder in that company. And you realize that as a stockholder, you have the right just to sign his check. He can give you the bill. You'll sign it. Give it back to him. He can take that to the accountant in the company and get paid the 40 bucks for cutting your grass. But it's going to have a negative effect on your stock. It's coming out of your stock. 
So what if you decide, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to take that route. I'm not going to devalue my stock. I'm just going to give you a check for cutting my grass. But what you've done now is you've given them two pieces of paper. Each one is worth $40. This $40 check does not cancel out the $40 remittance. The $40 check is what they're charging you to do the administration on your remittance. They sign it on your behalf. They send that off. They're getting paid twice. All you have to do is take that remittance, put value across it, assign value to it, accept it for value, send it off to them. They can now, now it's money. Now you valued it. You've treated it like a remittance as a species of money and you're done. And we've been doing this and we've even got them on tape acknowledging that you can do it. We've got a peace officer acknowledging it, uh, that you, we always have this option when dealing with these things. If you look on those tickets, they'll tell you payment instructions. Dispute instructions. So you can pay or you can dispute. If you choose the dispute route and you go in there, they'll give you a piece of paper and it says right on it, date of date dispute was created. Dispute created by. You created dispute. You never offered discussion. You never offered anything. You jumped right into the dispute and now you're in dishonor. Whether or not you win in court doesn't really matter. You're in court in dishonor. All you had to do was accept what they give you, say, I value that, there you go, take it back. Now, how can you do this? How can you just take a remittance and assign value to it? Oh, the value, how can you do that? Look, who's got their birth certificates on them right now? Pull it out and look at the back of your birth certificate. On the back of that birth certificate, you will find a number. It's a bond tracking number. The government generated and floated a bond when you were registered as a child. This bond generates revenue every year. The Federal Minister of Finance is acting as your fiduciary agent in trust over your account. When's the last time you told him what to do with your money? Never. So his obligation then is under the Financial Administration Act his obligation is to transfer it to a registered representative. That's your provincial, rep your provincial representatives. They do this every year in the form of the federal transfer payments. Part of what they're transferring, part of what your federal representatives are transferring to your provincial representatives is money generated from your bond, and you, they have no right to touch that money whatsoever if they're not acting as your representative. You are going to tell them, look, you want payment for this ticket? That's fine. Go take it from this transfer payment before you transfer it. You get paid, they get paid, you get discharged, there's no dispute, there's no conflict. And they don't like that too much. The violation tickets are the next thing. A violation ticket, we live in a place where everything from dog shampoo to, to Zamboni blades are all registered and regulated. Do you think these violation tickets, there's not a, a statute out there governing their use? There is, and you can't find a violation ticket act. A violation ticket is in fact a bill of exchange. It's just like a check almost. It's an unconditional order in writing addressed by one person to another, signed by the person giving it, requiring the person to whom it is addressed to pay upon a demand or at a fixed or determinable time a sum certain in money to or to the order of a third party or the bearer. Sounds like a big complicated thing. It's not. Look at the bill of exchange or at your violation ticket. Every little element of that bill of exchange is found there. Here's what they want you to do. They want to say, here's your ticket. You sign the original. They keep the original. They give you a copy. Now go to court, pay up or go to court. Under the Bills of Exchange Act, let's suppose for a moment you're in a restaurant. When a waitress comes and gives you a bill after you've eaten your meal, that is a bill of exchange. If she signed it and presents it to you, she's not getting paid herself. You're going to pay upon demand a third party. It's a bill of exchange. Now let's suppose for a second the waitress puts down this bill and you go to pick it up and she goes, you can't do that. You've got to sign the back of that bill so I can take it over to these bouncers. They can come over and beat you up for refusing to pay for it. And you say, what the heck kind of restaurant is this? 
No, I'm not doing that. I'm not into getting beat up. I want to pick up that bill. And they won't let you have that bill. Do you owe anything? No. No one can claim you owe them anything unless they present you with the bill. This is what the government is doing with their, with their violation tickets. Cop pulls you over. They offer you a chance to hold the bill and sign it. If you refuse to sign it, they'll say, okay, you've dishonored it, and they'll sign the back. I offered you a chance to sign it. Under the Bills of Exchange Act, if I present you with a bill, you sign it and give it back to me, you have just dishonored a bill of exchange. You didn't pay for it. You didn't get a receipt. I created it. It was in your possession. I can prove that with your signature. Now it's back in my possession. You're in dishonor. That was my bill you dishonored. What they want you to do is dishonor it by signing it. The way to deal with it is to label that, that instrument as a bill of exchange. Tell them, I recognize that as a bill of exchange, and I'm accepting your presentment. No argument, no nothing. Go ahead, give it to me. I want the original. If they refuse to give you the original, and they will refuse to give you the original, because without that original in their possession, they have no reason to go to court. Without that in, the, in their possession, they've got no court. If you offer to accept it, and they refuse, they'll say, well, what, you, you don't want to sign it? Why should I dishonor your bill of exchange? I'm open to you presenting the original. If they fail to do that, they impose the blue copy. You take that blue copy to a notary public. The bill was never duly presented. He's claiming that he did. You'd have them stamp it protest for lack of presentment. You send that off to the third party, the Minister of Finance. They now have three days under the Bill of Exchange Act to either prove, uh, establish that it was in fact presented to you or to represent it. If they don't do that in that period of time, guess who's liable for the bill? The cop who endorsed it. Just like the waitress in a restaurant who created a bill, charged someone for lobster when they didn't even have it. You put it in the system, you have to pay for it. People who are doing this now, when they tell the police officers, yeah, that's a bill of exchange and I'm accepting your offer and I want the original, Boom, they're closing that book and they're pulling out another book with warnings. And they're giving people all these warnings, saying, well, I've already run your name through the computer. I've got to do something here, so I'm going to give you a warning. Okay, let's go to the next one. The notorial protest method of justice. This is one of my favorites. And we're going to wind this up pretty quick here. We should not have to create conflict in order to find justice. We should not have to create conflict with our fellow man to find remedy under the law. Lawyers want you in conflict. Lawyers want you in court. Lawyers want you in their adversarial system. There's another way. A notary public, if you read your notary act, you will find that a notary public is one of the most powerful people in this deck. They can do anything. They can perform, what's the exact word? Any duty found under any enactment, statute, or order. Say you have court. Oh, sorry, we don't have any sheriffs. Get a notary. Sorry, we don't have a clerk. Get a notary. We need a judge. Get a notary. They can do just about anything that, is, that anyone else can do under those acts. One of the things that, essentially, they're a court officer. They will attest for you, and what you are going to do is you're going to go through the process, the administrative process, that leads to court. And you're going to do it in such a way that the other party has no standing, so by the time you get to court, you're the only one there. Here's my judgment. Sign it. It's done. An administrative judgment will not be turned over because it has nothing to do with the facts. It has nothing to do with the law, and it has everything to do with the proper lawful steps necessary in order to get to a place of adjudication. The way we deal with it, first of all, if let's say Gary over there owes me money. I go to him, I say, Gary, you owe me money. Here's my bill, buddy. He can either reject it, he can say, no, I'm not touching that, or he can take it and say, yeah, I've got your bill, I've accepted it, but now I refuse to pay. Either way, he's, dis he's, he's dishonored my bill. A notary public, in order to use a notary public, and you will use them for a bill of exchange, I'll use it for the bill of exchange example, you can also use them for a notice of understanding and intent, you can use them for a claim of right. I, send a, I go to Larry or Gary and I say, Gary owes me money. I go to a notary public, you want to be notary public? I go to my buddy, notary public, say, notary public, Gary owes me money, that rat bastard, he's not paying me. 
here's my bill. I want you to hold on to my original. He'll hold on to my original, and he will create. He'll make a certified true copy of that bill, and he'll make a notice. He will send this to Gary. Say, look, buddy, I'm holding on to a bill. It's one of your bills. At least Rob says it is. You've got three days to come and pick it up. Now, actually, he's going to get ten. He's going to get three days for the mail to go out, three days to decide what to do, three days for his response to come back. You're going to have a Sunday in there. Essentially, you got ten days grace. If within that 10 day period, Gary doesn't come to my buddy uh, notary public and say, give me that bill, here's the money, make sure Rob gets it. Now he's in dishonor. The notary public is going to craft a document called the notice of dishonor. He's going to send me the original of that and he's going to send a copy to Gary saying, Gary, you're in dishonor. Here's your notice. Again, he's got the period of grace, the three days grace. If he shows up to the notary, oh, sorry, bad mistake on my part. Here, let me pay. It's done. If he doesn't at that point, now you're, at, you're in protest. You craft a notice of protest, you take it to the notary public, he stamps it, sends off the certified true copy to Gary, and Gary now has 10 more days. If at that point I don't find remedy, Gary doesn't show up, I've sent off the, the bill of exchange, he received the notice, he received a notice of dishonor, he's received a notice of protest, and he doesn't pay, I've won, game over. All I got to do is take my notarial package to any JP, any judge, and say, look, this is what happened. And the notary is the officer of the court. He's the guy who is attesting to the fact that this process, you've gone through it properly, and your opponent didn't even want to play. You win. They'll give you an order. You say, Sheriff, come with me. I'm going to see some property here. Do, 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 do. Are we having fun yet? I'm having fun. <laughs> student loans, who here has a student loan? Oh, that's what you're here for. <laughs> student loan, believe it or not, folks. And you'll find it in the bursting bubbles there. We have free education. Everyone has free education. You can access it at any time. Canada is a signatory to a covenant. Came into force in 1976. They acknowledge post-secondary education is a right. It's necessary for the development of a free and just society. It would be made equally accessible to all, and in particular, with the progressive introduction of free education. When you look in any of the Canada Student Loan Acts, you will find a section where they deal with deduction and set-off. Deduction is the difference between deduction. Let's say a notary here owes me 10 bucks and I owe him 10 bucks. We can just say, okay, you deduct your 10 bucks, I deduct mine, we zero it out, we're done. We're zeroed out. A set-off is kind of like a deduction, except there's no real actual debt. It's just a claim of a debt. See, he, I definitely owe him $10, and he then claims, okay, well, then maybe you owe me $10. You can claim and not have any actual debt. Merely claiming will be, be your set-off. Since Canada has no money, we have no money in circulation. It's all promissory notes. It's all fiat currency. It's not money. The government cannot put you in a situation where A, they've taken away the money, and then B, they put you in debt. The only way to get out of debt is to pay off with money. If you can't pay that off, you're a debtor, you're in uh, permanent servitude, essentially, uh, an indentured servitude. You're just a step above a slave, and that's unlawful. They gave you remedy. The remedy is in the form of the fact that because there is no money in circulation, you can point to the number on the back of your birth certificate at any time and say, here, pay this off. And that is the process with the paying off the student loans. You send them one letter. You say, hey, look, I heard this crazy guy talking about this number on the back of a birth certificate, and I got 20 simple questions. Answer these questions, and if you don't, you agree I get to answer them for you. Write them off that letter. They're swimming in these letters right now. They don't like me too much. When they don't answer, you send them off another letter, say, hey, I gave you an opportunity to answer these questions, and you didn't want to, so now I'm going to do that for you. Here's the answers to my questions. Now, based upon that, because of my answers, I now have a belief. I now have an understanding. And based upon that understanding, I'm going to craft a document called a claim of right. Where in a common law jurisdiction, we can establish any right we want by claiming that that right exists. I can claim the right to poke you right in the eye. If I give you notice of this claim and you don't do anything, and then I poke you in the eye, you got no complaint. None. 
If, however, I say I'm going to poke you in the eye and you say, no, you're not, that might hurt me. Now I don't have that claim. You are going to claim that you have the right to seize your bond revenue to pay off the debt demanded from you by the government. I mean, in one hand, they've got your money. They're taking your money. They're sending it from the federal representative to the provincial representative. They're doing it every year. This is your money. You're going to take a little bit out of that, put it on your student loan, zero out your student loan. Your province, Glenn, or what's, uh, what's the guy's Campbell. name? Campbell. Campbell, yeah. He's going to get less money that year. He's oh. not going to like it too much. Yeah, and the other 78 of them. Yeah, they all get less money. But the thing is, although your province might get less money that year, it's coming out of your infrastructure, your education, your hospitals. You're a member of your own society. You're no longer in debt. It all equals out anyways when you look at it from a big enough perspective, except this time it's balancing in your favor instead of your representatives. Is that actually yet? We are working very hard on that. People are sending off the, uh, the documents, and I just got an email about four days ago from a guy who's gone through the process, done his claim of right, and now whenever he goes and he's trying to find out what's happening, he's getting the big runaround. We had one guy very close to doing it, and then someone put some fear into him, and he was worried about, you know, lifetime of audit and whatnot. What, so, what if you can use that one once? I don't see why not. You're discharging your loan honorably. It's lawful. You're not ripping anyone off. You're just using money you didn't even know you had access to. According to the act, you can discharge it at any time. You can get your loan, be in university, and the very next day, yeah, I'm here to discharge my loan. Thank you. And the proper way to do it, it's, it's very difficult to get any of them to agree with you. But I can't find anyone who's willing to disagree with me. I've got a sister who works with the federal government. She's in the Department of Justice. She's a lawyer. She's a senior counsel for the Human Rights Department of Justice. She's a uh, assistant, no, she's deputy minister. Deputy, assistant Deputy Minister, something like that. We, we have a different outlook on life, and we've argued more than once. And if I'm wrong, she tells me flat out I'm wrong, and she'll call me all sorts of nasty names. She's got no problem telling me when I'm wrong. If I'm pretty close, she'll say, oh, well, I can neither confirm nor deny. If I'm dead on, no comment. No comment. I showed her my entire student loan package, the number on the back of the birth certificate. I said, read this. She leafs through it. She said, oh, yeah. I said, you didn't just read that right now. Did you read that? She said, I read it. Did you just read it right now? No comment. I said, well, you got a little bit of an obligation here. She didn't want to tell me anything because her client is the federal government. I said, well, your federal government, the federal government, your client has an obligation to the people I'm going to be talking to. And if I'm wrong, then I'm going to harm them. Therefore, you have an obligation to stop me if I'm wrong. Do you accept that? She said, yeah, I'll accept that. I said, am I wrong? No comment. <laughs>